I come before you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. You ready for a sermon on table flipping, coin pouring out, sheep and cattle driving Jesus? <laughs> It's a rare gospel, right? I mean, I, th I think actually it's, it's interesting because I've heard over the years different people express an appreciation for the gospel, this particular gospel lesson, because they're, they're like, well, if we're supposed to be like Jesus and follow Jesus, that at least we know it's okay to be angry now and again. And I might at the same time point out that the ratio isn't very good, is it? One story about Jesus. I don't even know if anger is really the right word. I'm not saying Jesus wasn't angry. But I, I favor the phrase righteous indignation. And now you probably do too. <laughs> Just, it rolls off the tongue. You want to say it with me? Righteous indignation. Do you ever get that? Do you ever get righteous indignation? Maybe well up within you. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Yeah, oh, all right. Lots of nods. This is good. You're with me. That's... Uh, Righteous indignation is a tricky thing, though. In order for it to be righteous, it needs to be measured against something, and that's probably the real trick. You know, there's uh, something to be said for how we discern between the two. But it's, you know, when I, when I, when I first read this gospel, I, I, I was always hoping that it would fall later in the gospel. It would make a little bit more sense if, like, this happened and then they crucified Jesus, right? I mean, not that we, we want that outcome, but we know it's going to happen. It would make more sense if it came later. And, and really, or, or better yet, maybe, uh, if, if this happened, like, on that morning when Jesus didn't get to sneak away and pray. And then you'd be like, well, see what happens when Jesus doesn't get to sneak away. He gets grumpy Jesus. Righteous indignation Jesus. It also makes me think a little bit about the fact that, you know, Jesus clearly, you know, wherever it falls in the gospel, and it's early in the gospel, but John's gospel's just structured so differently than our others. Uh, it makes me wonder a little bit if, uh, well, it, it, not wonder in this case, I would say it's clear to me that it's not Jesus' first trip to the temple, right? So he waits, his timing is deliberate. And strategic. He waited until he'd been baptized, until he'd been out in the desert, prepared for ministry. He waited to be clear about what was happening. It makes me wonder, instead, did he hear other people grumble about this practice in the temple, or was it just kind of this thing that he had recognized, but he still waited until the timing was right, until he had the right answer for the Pharisees who would come and question him about his, you know, what authority he had, or what what drives his action here. I think so often with my own righteous and unrighteous indignation, yeah, we probably both have, I, I, I'll speak for myself, I got a little bit of both from time to time, but more often than nothing, it comes out not as flipping tables and you know, pouring out the coins. We leave those ways behind when we're children, usually. Instead, it comes out as grumbling. You ever grumble about your indignation? Maybe to yourself more than anybody else. Maybe to anybody who will listen, depending on just what the topic is. Uh, grumbling, grumbling's okay. I mean, sometimes we need to grumble. It's maybe even good for our soul. It gets some of that indignation out so that it's not all bottled up inside. But it's really not the best plan for what, if it's really righteous indignation, uh, we shouldn't save it for grumbling. It reminds me a little bit of what my dad used to do when he'd see a, a small child throwing a fit. He'd see a small child throwing a fit, and he'd go, hmm. And the kid would kind of look, and he'd say, you're doing it wrong. And th then he had the kid's interest, right? Doing it wrong. What do you mean I'm doing it wrong? He says, you're not, you're not loud enough. You've got to wail and really shake around. I mean, if you really want to throw a fit, do it right. Kid would start to chuckle a little. He said, lay down on the floor so you can flail all four limbs and really let it out. If you're going to throw a fit, do it right. Now, Jesus knew how to do it right. And I'm saying is if it really is righteous indignation about something, then we're probably not doing it right. When it's righteous indignation, 
We should be not just grumbling to ourselves and anybody who might listen to us for a few minutes. We should be throwing a fit. We should be flipping some tables, pouring out the coins, driving the sheep and the cattle out of the temple. But the real trick becomes discerning what is truly righteous indignation and what simply upsets us for whatever reason. I think the commandments that are paired with this in the book of Exodus actually might serve as a good litmus test. If we take the commandments about honoring God and understanding our relationship with God and our relationship, it's not about judging other people. It's about judging ourselves and the actions that we will make or not make in any given day, any given week, in our own lives. And if we could weigh whatever it is we're upset about against these commandments, is it something that interferes with our relationship with God? Maybe it is right to be angry or upset about it. Is it something that makes it impossible for us to observe the commandments like honoring father and mother or or honoring the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. If it interferes with that, maybe unjust labor practices, which would deserve righteous indignation. If it interferes, well, not just with us, but with all of God's children. Or maybe most especially, does it prey upon those who are least able to defend themselves? Then grumbling's not enough. We need to throw a righteous fit to go with our righteous indignation. I think that Lent might be just the time for us to graduate from grumbling and move on to righteous indignation and throw in a good old fit when we see that things, that our gods are being disrupted or upended. This may not always require flipping tables and pouring out coins. Probably won't involve driving out sheep and cattle. (laughs) Who's to say? But I hope that as we examine our own frustrations in the world and those things that we feel indignant or angry about, They will pause and weigh them against the commandments and what we know to be true of God through the scriptures. They will bring them to one another to examine them and discern together, is this something that I just need to grumble about and get get over it? Or is this something to be truly righteously indignant about and that we really ought to band together and throw a fit so that we might actually facilitate change? And do away with those things that degrade and diminish the household of God. Whether they're within the walls of the temple or not, we're called to be God's people and bring about the kingdom of God. And to do that, sometimes, we need to throw a fit. Amen.